Today, I am deeply honored to be interviewing one of the great political thinkers in American history. George F. Will is the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Washington Post. He is a frequent contributor to national news networks. He's the author of over a dozen influential books, including The Conservative Sensibility, which was just published last year. And we're going to be talking about that today. So, Dr. Will, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your time. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the program. I'm delighted to be with you. So, you know, the first thing I want to do is just give our followers a sense of how important you are to the conservative movement and how long you've been advocating for conservative principles. And I think the best way to start that off is to talk about the person that you dedicated your most recent book to. So Barry Goldwater being the Republican nominee for president in 1964, can you tell me a little bit about what he meant to you and why you dedicated your book to him? Sure. Uh, I dedicated it in part because in the words of Richard Grover, a very fine political journalist at the time Goldwater was running in 1964, described Barry Goldwater as the cheerful uh, uh, malcontent. And which demonstrated that that adjective cheerful and that noun malcontent could go together. I'm a malcontent and I hope I'm also cheerful. I graduated from college in 1962 where I was a kind of standard orthodox, mildly centrist Democrat. I've supported John Kennedy. Now, at that time, it's well to remember that John Kennedy was perhaps to the right of Richard Nixon on the great Cold War issues. I went to England to study at Oxford for two years and was impressed by two things there. One was how the collectivism, the watery socialism of the British Labour Party was, I, in my judgment, suffocating the energies of a great people. And I also went and made a trip, several trips to Berlin, where I saw the Berlin Wall, which had just gone up in August of 1961. So having seen socialism in the domestic life of Britain and the face of international communism, I came back in 1964 and cast my first presidential vote for Barry Goldwater. He was a delight for a young man at that time because he minced no words, partly because he knew he was going to lose. He knew after the Kennedy assassination that the American people weren't going to have three presidents, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Barry Goldwater in 14 months. So, uh, he was a free man to say what was on his mind, and what was on his mind was a kind of libertarian, southwest, wide open spaces, leave me alone, get out of the way, semi-libertarian conservatism that uh, appealed to me greatly. That's why. There's another relationship, I mean, there's several, of course, that you mentioned in the book, that another one that really spoke to me, which is, you talk briefly about your relationship with William F. Buckley and how that developed in your work with the National Review. Can you kind of go into that, how you got involved in the conservative movement in that way? Sure. I, I was teaching uh, at the University of Toronto when I got a call inviting me to come to work on the Senate staff for a Colorado senator named Gordon Allen, who was quite conservative. I worked there for three years, and toward the end of the three years, I wanted to do something else. And uh, I could have gone back to the University of Toronto, but no one ever leaves Washington, it turns out. So I, I'd written a few things for Bill Buckley, and I called him up and said, I think you need, which he'd never had, a Washington editor of National Review. Bill essentially said, you're right, I do, and you're it. Bill liked to collect uh, young people who thought had some promise, and uh, he took a flyer on me, and, and I spent three years with National Review. Uh, at that point, I transitioned to be, take over the back page every other week of Newsweek, and he uh, have a, a syndicated column as well. Yeah. One of the, the really interesting things about that relationship, is, and you talk about this in the book, is that you came at conservatism from an atheist side, you know, in terms of the spiritual background. And of course, Buckley didn't, you know, he was a famous Catholic. He wrote Nearer My God, you know, at times he was very uh, explicit about his spiritual beliefs, and yet you were able to work together. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about um, really the argument for an atheist to also be a conservative? Yes, I've uh, uh, described myself as an amiable, low-voltage atheist. I don't want to convert anyone away from their beliefs. Uh, live and let live is my axiom. I grew up in a thoroughly secular household. The subject never came up. And I've never felt the theistic urge or impulse. Bill's view was that a conservative need not be religious, but he cannot despise religion. And I think that's 
a perfect formulation of it. I certainly do not despise religions. Religion, it seems to me, is poetry. The great religions are poems, in a sense, uh, and they're great for a reason, and they endure for a reason. That is, they, they speak to timeless, perennial human desires, wants, and aspirations. A proper religion, and here I rule out the deism of some of our founding fathers, a proper religion enjoins, tells you to do certain things, explains certain things, like the universe, how we got here, uh, and consoles, offers consolation for life's uh, tragedies and disappointments. And These are three noble things. Well, and you talk about sort of the diverse uh, spiritual beliefs, even within, within the American founders, you talked about, or you wrote about John Adams and, uh, you know, how his beliefs uh, were different than what many might assume, closer in some ways towards the end of his life to Thomas Jefferson. Obviously, you got Payne in there, Washington, who was pretty private. And yet they all, as you said, had a valuation of religion that saw it as important to a lot of people and to their virtue. They had an instrumental view of religion. Even those founders who were not themselves devout had an instrumental view in that. They said a republic requires more than any other form of government, virtue on the part of the people. And they said, as an empirical matter, we have learned from history that religion is a necessary buttress of a nurturer of virtue. So they thought that uh, you had to have a, a religious people to be a free and responsible people. One of the dramas of 21st century America is that we are becoming more and more secular, particularly the rising generation is uh, the, probably the most secular in American history. So we're going to find out yep. whether or not the empirical claims by the founders were true or false. And as someone who myself, as you've said, is not religious, I'm open to evidence. And it yeah. could be that uh, that's, a, that's misfortune. Well, you know, I, I remember being in college and joining conservative clubs, and we had people there who were Christian. We had, you know, Catholic or Protestant. We had uh, Jewish folks there. We had people who were agnostic and people who were atheists. And we could agree on certain overarching themes and still collaborate and work together. One of those big themes that you talk about ex extensively and uh, I've written about um, in the book as well is this notion of the permanency of human nature. Uh, can you kind of explain what that means and how important that concept was to the Constitution? I'll come at it negatively. If When you deny the permanency of human nature, you open a vast and dangerous scope for politics. Human nature itself becomes pliable, malleable, and the subject of government action. Once you say that human beings are soft clay that will take the impress of whatever is pressed upon it, governments will undertake what they call consciousness raising and consciousness controlling. That's the whole point of the totalitarian enterprise, is to totalize life and saturate every nook and cranny and corner of life with politics. The founders said, no, there is a permanent human nature because we human beings are more than creatures who acquire whatever culture we're immersed in. Therefore, they said, natural rights are rights that are necessary to the flourishing of people of our natures. Natural rights is the heart of the founders' doctrine. And again, once you sever natural rights from the idea of a fixed human nature, then natural rights are whatever the government thinks you ought to be given to produce the kind of people that the government wants to produce. Uh, the, the, the simple truth is that that way is a great jurisdiction for government and a dangerous one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you talk about uh, Woodrow Wilson and the experiments in the early 20th century and his dedicated efforts to move away from the founders and the, the founding principles. Where do you see progressivism most prevalent today? Woodrow Wilson was the first president to criticize the American founding, which he did not do peripherally. He did it root and branch. He said the, net, the doctrine of natural rights is wrong because the doctrine of a fixed human nature is wrong. And the separation of powers, which was the founders' answer to the problem of how to control the government, 
rather than the government just controlling us. The separation of powers was, he said, a fatal mistake. He says, well, all very well when we were a nation of only 4 million people, 80% of us living within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater on the fringe of an unexplored continent. But, said Wilson, now that we're a, a vast continental nation united by steel rails and copper wire, we need to have a more energetic regulating government. The great mistake, the great non sequitur at the heart of progressivism is exactly that. The progressives say, as society becomes more complicated, government must become more enveloping and interventionist. That's exactly wrong. Uh, the conservatism that I practice that owes so much to Frederick Hayek says, no, that's the reverse of the truth. The more complicated society gets, the more it depends on the spontaneous order of a free people collaborating to make billions of decisions a day that produce the churning, the wholesome churning and creative destruction, to use Schumpeter's great phrase, of a free society. Uh, this is where, by the way, uh, American conservatism blends with, and owes a great debt to, Edmund Burke. All right. Because, because the, what, what, uh, what Friedrich Hayek called the, emphasized the spontaneous order, the creative spontaneity of people, uh, is what Burke had in mind when he talked about the slow evolution of social arrangements, that there is a society that is an entity distinct from the, the government, and society is creative if allowed to be by the government and should be respected. So th th there are great differences between American conservatism and European conservatism, but Edmund Burke is, it seems to me, the bridge that brings the best of European conservatism into Levin American conservatism. Yeah, I, I was hoping you were going to say that because you know I uh, saw you on Morning Joe and you had mentioned that uh, American conservatism is blending in or becoming more Europeanized. Can you explain that a little bit more? Kind of flesh out those differences and where do you see the conservative movement today? Yes, yeah, one of the crowning and dis displeasing paradoxes of our current political moment is that those who have set out to make America great again are actually trying to make it less American and more European. By that, I mean the following. European conservatism was born in reaction against change in defense of confessional states, the unity of church and state, against attacks on hierarchy and, ca and class systems, uh, nobilities, aristocracies, and all the rest, a landed gentry often in parts of Europe. That's, so European conservatism had more than American conservatism ever has had, a kind of blood and soil tribalism and a throne and altar, large role, almost sacerdotal role for the state. American uh, conservatism, it, is frankly, we are the, the legatees of classical liberalism. By that, I mean the liberalism of John Stuart Mill, John Locke, uh, Lord Acton, and a lot of others. Uh, American conservatism means to maximize the sphere of individual autonomy on the assumption, again, this is a Burkean assumption, that free people with their consensual relationships in a fast-moving society, open to change, uh, is, is the secret of, of happiness, uh, the pursuit of which is, of course, what the American nation is founded for. Uh, one, one of the things that I get from Burke as well is um, this appreciation for history. And, uh, you know, you, we look at what socialist and progressive experiments have yielded, and uh, it, we can learn from them. We can we can make uh, distinction. One of the, one of the things that I've talked about frequently uh, on our show is that the the failures of the Soviet Union weren't isolated to the Soviet Union because it was a larger failure of progressivism. And we are seeing that in Venezuela today. Is that, you know we've seen what Hugo Chavez has wrought, and now Maduro has to deal with re refineries being hard broken to the point that the country is just on collapse. And uh, progressives will say, well. They're just doing it wrong. But when we trace it back to these deeper themes, uh, you know, a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature and its malleability, then it allows us to derive from history evidence of that and make a convincing argument. At least I hope it does.
Yes, conservatives, it seems to me, do not just accept the law of unintended consequences. They are, in many cases, conservatives because of the law of unintended consequences. That law is that the unintended consequences of large government interventions in complex societies are often larger than and contrary to the intended consequences. Again, the secret is to appreciate what Hayek constantly stressed, which is complexity and the imperfect acquisition of knowledge by any individual. The beauty of markets, oh, what markets are, are information generating and organizing and allocating and aggregating devices. What invariably defeats governments, and frankly, we were lucky in a sense that our communist adversaries were communists because it guaranteed a kind of institutional incurable stupidity that was going to bring them down in the end, which indeed it did. That's one of the reasons why I think we're, in, in a way, the Chinese Communist Party is, of course, our great adversary now, but it's an enormous burden uh, over the long haul on a society of 1.4 billion people, the idea that, that a, a party can boss those people around without sacrificing the creativity of the people. So in that sense, uh, once you understand the complexity you get back to what I called earlier in our discussion here, the central uh, fault of progressivism, the great non sequitur, which is social complexity requires more and more government minute management of society. The real truth is the more complicated we become, the less government can do that yeah. without making an awful hash of things. Well, you know, and, and something else that I think we can find agreement on is uh, imperfect information and imperfect people. Uh, Burke has this famous quote where he says that uh, we shouldn't try to be angels. We'll do well enough just trying to be good. That's going to be enough work for us. And, uh, you know, but uh, George, here was a question that I had is what I, I think I've seen um, during my time in the conservative movement is a growing lack of humility and a self-assurance, even within the movement itself, to the point that if you say anything positive about anyone who doesn't fit your narrow description of conservatism, then you're out. You're a rhino. You're not a real conservative, yeah. whatever it is. And yet, isn't our entire philosophy against this perfect, you know, like perfection of human nature, which applies to us. I'm not perfect, you know, and I don't think that any conservative should claim to be, and yet we seem to act as if if we just get rid of all the liberals or the moderates or all the or whoever it is, that somehow uh, everything will be perfect. So. Just as uh, Judge Learned Hand, one of the probably the greatest American jurists never to serve on the Supreme Court, once said in his Godkin lectures at Harvard, which I gave a few years after he did, he said the spirit of liberty is the is the spirit that you're not too certain you're right that we have things to learn from other people. I've been in Washington 50 years. This is my 51st year here. And in that 51 years, the greatest pleasure and privilege I had was getting to know the man who was my best friend, Senator Pat Moynihan of New York, certainly the finest social scientist ever to serve in, in Congress. Uh, I learned a lot from him. I hope he learned something from me. Uh, there was a creative, friendly tension. Yeah. I mean, what an impoverished life we will lead if we if we retreat to our tribes, pull the covers up over our head, and pout when we can't be around people who agree with us entirely. That sounds to me boring, and boredom is the, is one of the worst things that can happen in life. Yeah, you know, I, I've learned so much from my friends who have different beliefs, whether it's political in terms of liberal or moderate or spiritual in terms of, as I said, atheist, Jew, whatever, Catholic, all the things. And to me, that it doesn't mean that I have to fully agree with them to, to work with them on, on important tasks that we identify as being mutually beneficial. So my, my last question for you today is when we've talked about coalition building, we talked about your relationship with Buckley and we talked about, you know, how long you've been, uh, in the conservative movement, you know, writing books, writing your columns and everything else. How did we rediscover that sense of coalition building that says, you know what, we may not agree on every last little detail of why, you know, rights came into being or, you know, which is the best political philosopher. 
and yet we can agree on some of these central principles and work together. How do we rediscover that spirit today? Well, to, to rediscover that spirit, we have to lower the temperature. And lowering the temperature will help us lower our voices. The fact is what we, we conservatives particularly, have to stand up against what's now being called the Flight 93 spirit. That insane, foolish essay written in uh, before the 2016 election, we said, this is our last chance for the republic. It's now or die. We're hearing the same thing all over again in 2020. Uh, the president said uh, just the other day, if, uh, if uh, he's not reelected, the country's finished. We'll all be speaking Chinese. Now, that's just Trumpian noise. But leaving that aside, uh, this country was not made by fragile people, and it is not fragile. This is a, this is a tough country with good, sturdy institutions that have withstood not just in the last three and a half years, but off and on over 200 and some years, a lot of assaults. So calm down, everybody. I, I, now I've said before that if, if I'm ever dictator of America for a day, I'm going to require that the only permissible college major is going to be history. Uh, it's so tiresome to have to keep reinventing the wheel in every generation. Uh, America's biggest failing today, and it's, it's, it's very dangerous for a nation, is we are not producing elites that love and understand the country. We're not producing from our institutions of higher education an understanding of the principles of the founders. Uh, elites don't reproduce themselves spontaneously. It takes work. And that's one of the, uh, at the top of the conservative agenda should be to reclaim the universities, not for conservatism, but for openness. Yeah, no, no I totally agree. I, I think we were talking uh, before we started recording that one of the first times I got to see you live was at CPAC. And I enjoyed going to that conference and just soaking up, you know, everything that you've experienced in in the movement and the lessons that you had for us. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Will, for spending time with us today. I really appreciate, you know, everything that you said and, uh, you know, for spending this afternoon with me. Well, I've enjoyed it. And you have a, uh, you have an organization with Edmund Burke in the title. So you have a grave responsibility to live up to that. Uh, we'll do our best, sir. But uh, you certainly helped us today. I think, I think you're doing well. Right. So have a good one.